All right, guys. Well, welcome to our seventh webinar. And uh, this one, we're going to go over some decoder installation general guidelines. Uh, we're going to show you some specific examples and also kind of some tips and principles to keep in mind when you're uh, doing your installations. Now, first off, I just want to introduce myself. My name is George Bogatuck. Uh, my primary function here is a product specialist and on the sales team. And uh, so I primarily talk to the hobby shops, the retailers, and then I also go out and spend a lot of time talking to you guys at shows and clinics and other meets and things like that. So now the first thing we want to do is we want to talk about the tools and supplies that you want to have on hand. Uh, first off, of course, you want to have a soldering iron. Just really to get fundamental, we always recommend you solder your wire connections and uh, your terminals onto the uh, decoder boards, things like that. It gives you a much better connection. Um, and a very reliable one. And once you practice soldering and get used to it, it's actually a very easy task. It doesn't, it's not quite as difficult. And of course, you want to make sure you have the right tools. So first off, we'll start with a low wattage soldering iron. The one you can see there pictured is one that I had bought years ago from Radio Shack. And I do realize the Radio Shacks aren't around anymore, or at least not on every street corner like they used to be. Um, but they do still have an online presence. You can also find similar ones that you can buy online from Weller. Um, and other brands, but ideally this is a good soldering station because you can adjust the temperature. The plug is grounded. Um, we have had a couple instances where customers would have continued uh, failures come to find out that their soldering irons were cheap $10 soldering irons they bought years ago, and it was actually grounding or sending voltage through the tip into the decoder and causing damage. When they found that out, they changed soldering irons, problem went away. So. Make sure you get a good one. Uh, you also want to have a fine tip so that that way you can really get into your work and you can get those tight fit applications. You don't have to worry about possibly uh, touching wires or anything like that. You want to use a rosin core solder. I always recommend the smallest diameter you can find. Um, we here use a lot of lead free stuff, so our equipment's a little bit different. Um, but this is the kind of some of the stuff that you're mostly going to be able to find at home. But the reason I recommend a small diameter solder is because you can always add solder to your joint. It's a lot harder to take a little bit away. So if you're using these big giant diameter solders, you probably want to go look and get, you know, spend the $10 or $15, whatever, and get you a nice roll of very fine diameter solder. The next one I cannot stress enough. You want to make sure you have flux for work with electronic projects. There's a lot of times we'll see failures come in because they're using pipe flux or whatever they find at the Home Depot. And the biggest issue there is that the different fluxes have different purposes. And so the higher acidic content tends to attack the electronic components on our circuit boards. And so if you, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you get a flux that's designed for work with electronics. Now what flux is, is this is a paste or a liquid type material that you can brush onto your joint or put onto your joint. And what it'll do is it helps clean the material, the, the metal that you're soldering, and also will help draw the solder off your iron and into the joint. Really quickly, we're going to be doing our next webinar is going to be uh, successful soldering. So we'll get into the tips and details of how to do this. We'll actually show you examples live right here on there. But we also will have some tips on our YouTube channel as well. So be sure to check those out. Now, moving in along the list, uh, you want to have a good set of wire strippers. Uh, you want to make sure that you have an adjustable diameter wire stripper so that way you're not cutting the wire and you're just pulling off the insulation on your wire. Uh, you want a good multimeter, uh, something you can use to go test for continuity, test for resistance, things like that. And of course, you're going to have a mini screwdriver set because you are going to be disassembling the model. So you want to make sure that you've got the tools that you need. It's always good to have a hobby knife around. This is something I always recommend to use silicone or RTD sealant. Um, what this it will do is you can use the silicone to secure your speaker in place. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get further into the clinic here. Um, or you can even use it to tack wires up into the corner of your shell so that they're up and away and out of the mechanism. The thing I like about using silicone is the fact that it dries fairly quick and, and solidifies, but here's the best part is it will adhere to the plastic so it doesn't attack it, but if you need to remove it for whatever reason, it's easily pliable so you can pull it right out without damaging the shell. If you were to use something like cyanacrylate or super glue to help hold your wires in place, if you remove that, you have to get in there with your knife and start chiseling it away and potentially can damage, especially if you're trying to hold uh, the shell with fine details. So you want to make sure that you're using 
a uh, uh, silicone so that that way you can just pull it out if you need. Diagonal cutters, wire cutters, something like that. Uh, Dremel tool or a hacksaw. Uh, we may need to remove some weight. We'll talk about that. Ideally, a, a milling machine, but not everybody has access to one of those. So you want to make sure you've got some tools to be able to remove weight or modify the body shell if needed. Um, and then a heat gun or heat source for heat shrink tubing which then of course leads us to our other little small things that we might need, heat shrink tubing, uh, micro connectors, or our DBX 9000. These are different types of connectors that allow you to dis disconnect the body shell, or in the case of the DBX, it's a locomotive to tender wiring kit that you can just simply unplug, separate the locomotive and tender for storage in uh, its original box or servicing, things like that. Speaker gaskets, we have a bunch of laser cut speaker gaskets that help adhere speakers to uh, the, either the mounting inside the body or the mount that you've provided. So uh, they're laser cut designed to fit our speakers. Sheet styrene or a speaker baffle. Um, as we talked about in, in our, one of our classes, DCC and sound theory, you do need a baffle for every speaker because again, as the speaker air co uh, cone uh, moves air pressure, you want to baffle that from the front and the back of the speaker. So we're going to be building baffles in some cases, or we can use the commercially available baffles that we have in our product line. Double-sided tape, you can use that to mount the decoder or other things up and away inside the shell, things like that. And then you want resistors or any LEDs or light bulbs or anything that you're going to be doing installing with the model. You want to make sure you have all that on hand when you're ready to go. So when we look at our model, we've got, we got several basic steps. These are common things that you're going to see with any installation that you're going to do. First of all, you're going to select the locomotive. And I'm highlighting testing the stall current. We're going to have a brief conversation about that again and why it's important. You want to plan out the installation. You want to make sure that you're not kind of doing it on the fly. You want to make the installation look clean. Also helps you go back and do better troubleshooting if you do find something wrong. We'll make any modifications to the body shell or the frame. Uh, fit the speaker and secure it in place, install and wire the decoder, and then we're going to test the installation before we're finished up and ready to go. So first up, what we're going to do is we're going to match the decoder to the locomotive. So when you select a, a decoder, you want to make sure that the model you're, going, you're, you're installing into has all of the features that are going to work with the decoder. We're going to talk about how to do that. So first off, the first thing you want to do is pick a smooth running model or tune up the mechanism. The, the old adage with DCC is that you can make a good model run great with DCC, but you cannot make a poor model run well with DCC. And there's so many different instances and things like that that you can go into if you have sticky mechanisms or binding gears. You want to clean that stuff up first before you really get into it. Speaking of gears, avoid the ones with noisy gears because then that gearing, that grinding, that sound's going to compete with your sound coming out of the speaker. So you really want to make sure that you clean that up and have a smooth running mechanism and a quiet mechanism before you go install. Now, this is something I really highlight here. Don't tap, attempt to ta uh, test or tax your skills on the first try. Uh, for those of you guys that are learning for the first time, don't grab that brass model of that 484 that is you know, several thousand dollars worth and go to do it and start hacking it up and end up finding out that you ruined the model. Uh, start with something good and easy to start with first, uh, whether it be a plug and play or a simple rewire, something like that. That way you get familiar with what you're doing first and then work your way up to that as you learn different uh, tasks. The other thing I want to highlight here is the term DCC ready. And this is one that apparently trips people up a lot all over. Um, the term DCC ready simply means that the motor is isolated from the frame. Usually in a lot of cases, um, let me show you some things here. We've got a whole bunch of different circuit boards here that I've taken out of models over the years. These are different circuit boards that basically all do the same type of thing. Um, you recognize this picture was, this was one that was in the picture there. This is the one out of Ather and they have their nine pin DCC quick plug. And so the advantage here is we can simply unplug the dummy jumper, set it aside, and then we can plug in our TSU 2200 right there. Or, we can replace this whole PCB with a TSU PNP. A lot of these circuit boards you're going to see are very similar. This is one out of a Cotto model that, again, a PNP board would simply replace it, or you can plug into the 8-pin plug. In this case, these jumpers, which may be hard to see on the camera, so I'm going to apologize in advance, but they're small little metal. Let's see if we can show that off really well there. It's just a small little metal jumper that's just bridging the gap between 
the eight pin plug. And so we unplug that and can plug in, and then this way we retain our LEDs, but we're gonna talk about those here in a little bit. But other circuit boards like this one here is actually doing the same thing essentially as this one. Um, I'm not sure why, but this one looks like a you know, 1970s science project out of something, but this is one that we removed. We replaced this with a TSU PNP. But if you look really closely right there, there's still the eight pin plug. So for whatever reason, they felt they needed all these uh, components on there. But essentially all of these are doing the same thing, is they're taking the motor and routing the power from the track through the circuit board to the motor. So your motor is isolated from your track pickups. Now in another instance here, uh, this one here, a lot of you guys will recognize is an Atherin standard blue box chassis. Um, I kind of have it sort of in pieces right now for demonstration purposes. But what happens is, is the track pickup on here, on the wheels, on one side of the rail, are, uh, are going up through what I'll call these question mark shaped brackets right here on top. And so this is transferring track power from the wheel to that. And what Atherin has done on their later versions is they've actually included a wire to go to this circuit board that sits right here on top. Now the other side of it on the old blue box is actually transferring power through the top of this truck. And you can see this metal right under, right there you can kind of see it. That metal piece right there is actually transferring power to the frame. And so when that touches, it's transferring power to the frame, so your frame is hot. Now in the old blue box, the way this was handled was they had the motor actually had some teeth on the bottom of that motor that touched the frame. That's how power is, is transferred through the body shell. So what they've done with DCC Ready now is you take that and you remove the tabs. And then they have a wire attached that runs up to the decoder or in this case, the circuit board. So DCC ready simply means that the motor is isolated and you can then go in and make your connections the way you need. So the DCC ready doesn't mean that it has a plug. The other thing DCC ready means is that it does not have a decoder. If it says DCC equipped, then we know it has a decoder built into it. But if it's DCC ready, it does not have a decoder. So you will need to install a decoder of some form. When we're doing a decoder installation, we want to test our stall current. And a lot of this is something that apparently there's a whole lot of myths out there is, and misunderstandings of why we're measuring the stall current. The stall current is not measured because we think you're going to lock up the drivers and we want to make sure. And so a lot of people say, well, I test for slipping current. Well, that's because you don't fully understand what's happening fundamentally with the decoder. So years ago when we were uh, working with power packs, it was very simple. We adjusted the knob on the power pack, more voltage went onto the tracks, motor turns faster, model goes faster. Very simple. Decoders don't work that way. Decoders do not adjust the power going to the motor. What they actually do is they send momentary pulses of full track voltage, but for short periods of time. As you increase the throttle, the duration of the on period versus the off period becomes longer. This is what's known as pulse width modulation we are modulating or changing the width or duration of the pulse to determine how fast that motor is turning. The reason this is important, guys, is every time you go from zero to speed step one, you're creating a stall condition. Again, it has nothing to do with, we think you're going upgrade and you're gonna stall your motor out. That's gonna happen on occasion, especially if you've got a steam locomotive with rubber traction tires and a really heavy train that's underpowered. Yes, it can happen, but the reality is, is this is what this is why you measure stall current. Because if you've got a, a, a motor that stalls at say 1.5 amps and you have the one amp decoder attached to it, every time you go from zero to speed step one, that thing's drawing an amp and a half. You're running the risk of damaging those motor components inside the decoder. Therefore, you send it back. If you don't measure your stall current, you can't ha expect to know. Don't always go with the one amp. The other thing is the decoder will supply up to its rated value. So a one amp decoder will supply up to one amp of stall current. So if your motor stalls at 0.2 amps or 0.7 amps, you're fine. 
use the one amp decoder if you so choose. But again, if you have a motor that stalls at 1.5 amps, you're going to use the two amp decoder. But if you have that motor that stalls at 0.7, it's not that you can't use the two amp decoder. You can still use the two amp decoder because again, it will supply up to two amps. And so therefore you're not even taxing those motor components. Plus our two amp decoders are actually a couple of dollars cheaper than our one amp decoder. So it's really gonna be beneficial to go that route for you. But anyway, this is why we point this out is because if you put a decoder in that's not gonna be able to handle the current draw of that motor, you're asking for damaged decoders. These Atherin motors here, for example, these are high current draw. Uh, these tend to be uh, 1.2, 1.3 amp motor to, motors, uh, and you always want to test at about 16 volts to make sure you're overpowered. So when we test for stall current, we want to make sure how to do that. So the next step is to actually test it. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our multimeter. And again, this is an ammeter, and as you can see in the drawing, we take our ammeter, we hook it up in line from our power pack. We take our power pack and set the track voltage or the, the power going to it equal to that of our DCC track. So this is what I was saying. If you have 16 volts on your rails, you need to test your stall current for 16 volts. If your uh, home DCC system is 13 and a half volts, you can use that as well. Again, make sure your power that you're supplying to the motor is equal to that of your DCC track voltage because that's essentially what's going to be sent to your motor. Now, when you test for stall current, you're going to grab the model and you're going to gently press down until the wheels stop. And at that point, you're going to notice that you're going to get a, giant, a high number or your meter is going to peg out. You're going to notice that you're going to get those changes. And that's why you're measuring stall current. Take the highest reading. Do it several times and take the highest reading and use that. Compare it to the decoders. Pick the decoder that matches the model. In this case, you also want to make sure that when you're grabbing your model, be careful, don't grab the details. For example, find handrails, grab irons, things like that. Find a good place to do it. If you really don't like that idea, we can go to option number two. And option number two, again, uses our multimeter for testing. We're going back to high school physics here for a few minutes, guys. Uh, Ohm's law, which is voltage equals current times resistance. Where in this case, in order to find the current, we're rearranging the, the equation. So voltage divided by resistance equals current. So we take our multimeter here and I'm going to go ahead and do this here for you guys. Uh, what I do is I set my multimeter to ohms and what I would do is I would take the leads and I just realized this doesn't have brushes in it, but you would take them, the leads and measure across your motor terminals and you would get a reading. And that reading is going to tell you, okay, in this case, you know, a few, a few ohms here is going to show a resistance across there. Take that and plug that into the equation. So if we look at this illustration, we see that we're getting 20.8 ohms. So if we have 16 volts of track power, plugging it into the equation there, we're going to get 0.76 amps. So in that case, that Bowser model should be good to go with a one amp decoder, but you can use the two amp. Now, the biggest thing to note about this is that we're using our DCC track voltage. So if you have 14 volts on the rails, you would plug 14 volts in there. And if you notice, this current draw is going to go down because as voltage goes up, in order for the equation to balance, your stall current, or in this case, the dr current draw of the motor is going to go up as well. So you're going to see that balance as it goes. So again, this is a good example of why you want to use a lower track voltage if you can is because you're going to reduce your stall current and you're not even going to be taxing the motor capabilities. So next up, we want to plan the installation. We want to take our time, go through and make sure we know what we're going to do. So when we get in there, we're going to select our Tsunami 2 based on what we've found in the stall current with the model, the fit and all of that. We're going to pick the best one and we're going to go through and pick the sound files, whether it be Steam, EMD, GE, Alco, Baldwin and others and so forth. We're also going to go through and, sele and select the best speaker. And this is where once we picked the decoder, we want to make sure we pick a speaker that's capable of handling any power consumption that or power that the decoder is going to put out. So you want to match the size, the fit, the power rating and so forth. And in some cases, you may need to m use multiple speakers. Uh, for example, our mini cubes are very, very popular. But if you hook one of those up to our PNP decoder, the PNP decoder puts out two watts of power. 
the, t the Minikube speakers are only capable of handling up to seven tenths of a watt. So if you crank that volume up, you're going to overdrive and potentially damage and burn up that speaker. So in this case, you want to use two of them or more to help dissipate that power. You want to look at your model. You want to make sure that you've picked whichever lighting device you want to use, whether it be a light bulb, volt and a half, 12 volt, or LEDs. Um, there's a whole bunch of different range on that. We'll talk about those here in just a few minutes. And then the last thing, you want to make sure you take your time, make sure you have a clean, professional installation. Um, it's easy for troubleshooting and it's, and for those of you guys out there that do professional installations, you don't want to hand your customer something that looks like that on the screen because they're going to look at that and go, well, hell, I could have done that. And so you want to make sure that you look uh, and do your, your best to give a, uh, a good installation. Um, it's also going to help solve a lot of problems down the line later. So once we go through here, we have to identify which wires go where and isolate the motor. So this is where you're going to go through the model and you're going to identify, for example, the track pickup uh, mechanism, how where the wires are, where they're coming from. And this is where we can use our continuity meter to test and determine where all that is. So for example here, let's go ahead and, and show you guys another example of this. So we're going to take our multimeter here. We're going to set it again to ohm resistance. Now I'm going to take my truck out of this Atherin blue box and I'm going to take my leads here and let's say I want to find out which side of the track this particular power is coming from. So what I can do is I can take my one lead of the meter and hold it to this piece. Let's see if I can show this off pretty good here. So we're going to hold that down right there. Now we're going to take the other lead and we're going to touch the wheels. And you see that there's some continuity there. There shouldn't be any. But if I go to the other side, so you can kind of see how you're getting the different readings. I'm not sure why that's showing continuity across there, so I need to go in and inspect that truck a little better. Um, let's take a different one here. We're going to use this one. We're going to do the same thing. So I've got, this is a uh, truck out of an Atherin SW1500, one of their newer release versions. So I'm going to take this, and again, I'm going to touch my power to that lead. And when I touch this wheel, you see I'm getting a no circuit. But if I touch the other side of it here, you see I'm getting some readings. So this is how you can go through and identify where the uh, track power is coming from. So you want to make sure what you're doing and, wh and where to go for. The other side of this is when you look at your, your uh, model there, you want to take it apart, insulate the motor using electrical tape, foam tape, anything like that. So going back here to our, we'll use this blue Atherin Blue Box example one more time. This is where you can use insulating foam tape. So if we've got these teeth, on the bottom of the motor right here that are touching the frame. First thing we'll want to do is go in and cut those out and then in the bottom of our motor cradle here we can actually lay some electrical tape or something like that so when we put this motor back in place now we have a physical barrier between the track power going through the frame and the actual pole of the motor as it's working its way through. So now the other side of this is let's go back to some of these circuit boards we had. So when we're working with these next circuit boards, we want to check the NMRA A-pin plug and verify that it is properly insulated. Um, I can tell you this from firsthand example that there are times this 8-pin plug that's on these models have actually showed uh, issues down the way. Um, for example, uh, with a steam uh, Tsunami 2, the decoder is actually looking at back EMF coming in from the motor. And so if you have a short between track power and your motor leads through your circuit board, the decoder may interpret that low voltage as back EMF from the motor. And so you're going to get a chuff sound coming out of your decoder, even though the model is sitting still. So go through with your multimeter. And again, let's you know, put it to ohms and go through and test to make sure that the sound or these eight pin plugs are properly isolated and make sure that everything is done properly. Um, the other thing you'll want to know is on your PCB is that there are identifying marks to identify the orientation of how the model sits in or how the, the plug sits in here. So on this particular one right here, 
you can actually see that there's a one next to pin number one. So when you plug that in, your orange pin is going to go right to that pin number one. All of these have identifying marks, whether it be pin one, pin eight, pin five, or pin four, you can go through and identify so you can orient your plug properly. Now these are a couple of instances. The first one over there on the right, you can kind of see that's one we've talked about. So there's an example of laying some electrical tape down in the bottom of an Atherin blue box. Um, the other one on the left though is actually a little bit more of a troublesome and you're going to see this a lot more in some of the older models in some of the, this particular one here is a River OC PG1 and this was actually sent to us years ago but the tab that's uh, touching that motor terminal there is actually taking the casing power which is connected to the track and transferring that track power to the motor terminal and then the wire goes to the other side. So if you don't know to look for something like this, it can become very cumbersome or troublesome because you're not, it looks like part of the motor. It looks like it's supposed to be there. But this is actually what's transferring track power to the motor pole. And so you'll want to go through and either desolder it, cut it, move, remove it somehow, break it up, and actually run a wire from there to your decoder. And the reason we're isolating all of this is because we want our decoder to control everything inside the model. So as the power comes through with our DCC signal, the decoder is going to then interpret what to do and how to do it, and then it's going to send the power to the appropriate wires to go out to the various things on the model. And so we want our decoder to control that power. We don't want to have anything isolated or, or touching where it shouldn't be. So make sure you properly take the time, insulate your models. If you run into troublesome things like this, check out and see if you can find something like that that potentially can be causing the issues. Now, once we're isolated the motor, this is where we may need to modify the body, sh the body shell and or the frame to make room for a speaker. Uh, the one in the illustration there is an old uh, Proto 2000 GP38 that I had that I had done some milling and modifying to allow for a 16 by 35 oval speaker. Those old Protos didn't leave you much room for a speaker other than maybe inside the cab, but if you want to detail the cab interior, you don't have a whole lot of options. And so because of this, you may have to cut out and mill some weight. This is where things like the hacksaw or the Dremel are going to come in handy. Again, ideally you want to have access to a milling machine, but not everybody has that. So just kind of look at it. And this is where planning the installation is going to come in because we want to make sure we know where we're going to put that speaker. Make our modifications now before we start putting everything together because it's a heck of a lot easier to do it when all the wires are disconnected than after. This is also the time to modify the body shell if you've got speaker openings either, you know, on a steam locomotive you'll do them in the tender floor or you can drill out holes in the coal load to allow the sound to escape out of the model. Um, in a diesel in instance you can use radiator fans or even modify the fuel tank. There are also many models that already have a speaker mounted in it or at least a provision for a speaker. So take close measurements and find the best installation. You can see an example there at the top of a Kato F40PH where they have room for a 28 millimeter round speaker mounted right there in the body shell. So you just simply snap it into place, wire it up, you're good to go. If you need to make room for some speakers, there's sometimes, you, we've talked about weight, there's also some stiffening ribs or something like that inside of there that you can remove. Um, they're in there because during the casting process, they help hold the body square during the, the molding process. But once the body shell has been molded, you, you don't need to have that anymore. So you can cut those out and make room for your speaker up in the top of the body shell. As we've talked about, you always want to make sure you baffle your speaker. Again, you want to make sure the air pressure on each side of the speaker is isolated. You can kind of see uh, how in the second picture there where I've custom built a baffle for our uh, small uh, mega bass speaker to fit diagonally into an Atherin SD40. Um, it was a tight fit application and I had a very, very small clearance between that and the drive line, but you can make this happen. So don't always be married to the idea that you have to have a speaker square inside a model. Go with what's easiest and what's going to give you the best sound. Uh, and again, I use RTV or silicone as well as gas to, to, to secure the uh, speaker in place. And this is when you also take the opportunity if you have an older model and you're trying to install 
uh, lights, you want to make sure to drill the holes for lights. Uh, most of your modern ones have the holes for the lighting, headlight, backup light, and so forth. But if you're doing things like number boards or class lights, take the opportunity now to drill those holes, put those lenses in place, because once you get all the wires there, it's going to be a lot harder to manipulate and maneuver the shell. Well, once we've got everything prepped and ready to go, we wire and install the decoder. So this is a wiring diagram here for our TSU 2200. And this is where you're going to go red to the right rail and black to the left rail. And so again, this is where you take your, your trucks and you identify where everything's at. On our Athern motors, you're going to take the orange rail or the orange wire to your motor plus and typically attach it to the top of your motor. And then the gray wire will actually be mounted to the bottom. And so you want to make sure that is the case. Not all motors are easily identified and marked as such. And so when you're looking at that, you want to make sure that uh, you want to orient them properly. So when you're, if you're removing a circuit board, for example, a lot of times you're going to see a marking on there as M plus, M minus. And so that way you can identify and make sure it's wired correctly. Next up is our speakers. Let's wire in the speakers. And this is where uh, you're going to look at the power rating we've talked about. Make sure they match up the decoder. You can use multiple speakers, again, for better sound reproduction. This is something we've talked about in our previous uh, sound theory in DCC is about the different types of speakers. So you can see a couple of multiple speaker installations here, a, a series, which is what we recommend best for our Tsunami 2. Um, especially using 8 ohm speakers because they'll create a 16 ohm load or an impedance and that's actually going to be better for the amplifier because the amplifier is not going to work as hard. If you do them in parallel and create a 4 ohm load, the amplifier is actually going to be taxed a little bit and you run the risk of potentially damaging that amplifier. So again, you want to make sure that you're within the tolerance and specs of what the decoder offers. The last option there is what we call a series parallel where we actually use four speakers and we have a, a Intermountain Jivo Tier 4 that we wired up four mini cubes in, and we did two mini cubes in series, and then the other two in series, and then paralleled the pairs. Those four speakers working together are able to reproduce a lot better those low frequencies. And so, if you have the room in the model, this may be an option to consider. Now, the last thing we're going to do is wire in the lights. And so this is where you look at the model or the decoder and you wire your, typically your headlight is going to go to the white wire, uh, yellow wire is going to go to the backup wire, and you can see where all the different uh, FX3, 4, 5, and 6 are wired to. On the case of the PNP, you look there in the diagram, you can see F3, F4, F5, F6 written on those tabs on the side. Now, the one thing I do want to point out, actually there's two things on this PNP. First off is the optional 1.5 volt common. Now, if you're using a volt and a half light bulb, you can wire and use that in place of the 14 volt common that's designated on the end of the decoder. And this is going to give you a pre-regulated output. So again, this will help compensate for differences in track voltage. And you can see that circled there in the top photo. The second photo is an older decoder, but it still holds true with our Tsunami 2, is the common or plus 14 volt tab is actually indicated by an oval shaped soldering pad. And so if you look closely, you can see the gold color there is actually oval shaped on that second pin from the top. And that's going to be your plus 14. And so when you're using resist, uh, res uh, LEDs or 14 volt light bulbs, you're going to go to that tab. If you're using the volt and a half light bulbs, you're actually going to go to the 1.5. Now on our TSU uh, 2200s and the 1100s, these, are not, these do not have the option of a pre-regulated volt and a half, and so we have to look at the resistors and what's going on. So when we're selecting the resistors, we can go through, again, our high school physics equation, voltage equals current times resistance. So we're trying to solve for what resistor value. So we take our track voltage, our DCC track voltage, subtract the volt and a half that the light bulb is going to use, and divided by the lamp current. So in this case, let's say 16 volts on the rails, we have a volt and a half light bulb, so that's going to give us 14 and a half volts to solve or resist through to make sure we don't overtax that light bulb. These light bulbs are 15 milliamps, so that's 0 0.015 amps. So we use that in the equation, we're going to come up with 966.6 ohms of resistance. So in that case, we're going to use a 1000 or a 1K ohm resistor. Now again, ideally you want to do one resistor per lamp. And the reason for this is, is that, that if you say, well, I'm going to put two of these together in parallel, so I don't need to use as high of a resistor value. Well, yes, for the short term, it'll be fine. You'll 
it'll work just great. But if one of those light bulbs go out, now suddenly the other light bulb is receiving all of that power, potentially three volts, and then you're going to eventually cause it to go out as well. Also, same thing happens if you wire two light bulbs in series, then what happens is, yes, you can use a lower value resistor, but if one of those bulbs burns out, so too does the other one. So this way, if you have one resistor per light and you can use multiple lights per output up to 100 milliamps, uh, then you can adjust and know which one goes out. So if the light bulb goes out, you can just replace the one, put it back in, you're done. So it's really quick. The other option is you can, if you don't want to calculate this, you can use a, res, a regulator. Uh, this uses a couple of diodes and a resistor. There's a lot of circuits online you can find about how to use this and what, how to wire it up. And so you, you can go find that online. LEDs, I tend to use a lot of LEDs myself, partly because LEDs are actually uh, current sensitive more so than they are voltage sensitive. So when you put your resistor in line, you typically have that compensating and limiting the amount of current that's going through. So slight changes in track voltage, for example, 13 and a half at home versus 16 at the club are not going to drastically affect the brilliance of the LED, whereas that four volt difference on the, a volt and a half light bulb is going to have drastic effects because it's going to burn them out. So one of the things I do is I actually test uh, with a nine volt battery and a resistor because LEDs again are polarity sensitive. So you want to make sure that you have the proper terminal and you want to make sure that they work. So take a scrap nine volt battery that you've got laying around, solder a 1K resistor to one of the leads and test your, test your LEDs each time. This also gives you the provision if your LED already has a resistor on it, you can test it because you can just bypass the resistor. But always use the resistor first to make sure uh, that you're getting the proper. Because the uh, LEDs are less voltage sensitive, I typically use a 1000 ohm resistor for each of my LEDs. Uh, if I'm doing things like class lights or number boards, I can use a higher value resistor and it's just going to slightly dim it. But remember, the Tsunami 2 allows you to adjust that with a CV. So once we've got everything in, we want to test the wire. We want to test the decoder. We want to double check the wiring, make sure everything's wired where it's supposed to. Um, if you're uncomfortable or not sure, use the programming track. Try to read back CV8, and it should read back 141 for Tsunami and Soundtracks products. And make sure that that decoder is getting track power. If you receive an error on your track on your programming track, you can go in and test and find out where it is and what you overlooked. If it tests okay on there, put it on your main line. Put it down, test, run it, run it back and forth and make sure. Now one of the common issues is if your locomotive runs backwards, what's happened is you've probably got the polarity of the motor reversed. Ideally you want to take that apart and just move the wires. That's going to be your best option, but if, you don't, if you've already got it buttoned up, you don't want to do it, you can adjust it with CVs. Just keep in mind when you change CV29, it's also going to reverse your lights and so you can use uh, CVs to adjust that as well. So once we've got it tested, we want to tuck the wires up. Again, this is where our silicone can come into place, double-sided tape, stuff like that. Tuck it up, put the shell back on it, button it up, and enjoy. Uh, this is where we get to have a lot of fun and start using the Tsunami 2.